Hi, my name is Jeremy Shackey, co-founder and CEO of Lighthouse Labs, and I'd like to welcome you to the Navigator series, a series of panels featuring leaders in cybersecurity and data from across Canada, discussing their tech journey, what's impacting the current job market, and what to expect from the future of work. Today's session is titled Building Cyber Resilience, the Power of Essential Skills in the Hiring Equation, and we'll be discussing what it takes to succeed in the ever-evolving world of cybersecurity, as well as what does Canada need from its labor force in order to protect and defend its most critical assets. So without further ado, let's dive in. everyone, I'm lucky to be joined here by two incredible leaders from the Canadian tech scene. To my immediate left, George Alcura, the Chief Information Security Officer for Ruby. Welcome, George. Thanks, Jeremy. And joining George is Dominic Vogel, President of Vogel Leadership and Coaching. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you for having me. like that you named the company after yourself. It's bold. I'm very egotistical that way. Nice. I like it. Well, I'm very excited to get into this with both of you today. Let's go. Talk to me a little bit, George, about how you got into cybersecurity, a little about your journey, maybe the first job you did within the space. I'll let you start here. I got into it by accident. Um, I really had no prior formal education, anything to do with cyber before I got in. Uh, I was a career soldier before this. Uh, around 2015, 2016, I kind of didn't really want to do that anymore, like full time. I started to think, well, maybe I could try something in business. And I tried a couple small businesses, and I had a couple startups with varying success. And I fell flat on my face ultimately with all of them, which is apparently par for the course for most founders. It's called entrepreneurship, I'm pretty yeah. sure. That's pretty cool. <laughs> right on. So, you know, you go through that, like, uh, rush of a big contract and then that uh, famine of, um, you know, you haven't made money in a month and you got to pay bills, and that sucks. Eventually, a friend who I'd worked with in the Army for a long time uh, – hooked me up with an interview at the uh, global SOC that he worked at. It was a big consulting firm. And uh, I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't have a background for this. Like, I understood analysis because I had previously been in, like, a signals intelligence role within the Army. So I, I understood security. But in terms of just cyber stuff, I was really lucky that I had a manager or that the manager of the SOC at that time wasn't really caring about people with certifications, didn't really care about people with formal education in cyber. He cared about... Can you solve the problems? Are you a curious person? Are you a good team player? So based on kind of those parameters, I got through the job interview. I landed my first job as a SOC analyst. Um, and then from there, it, it's kind of re- it, it's hard to put into words the, um, how fast I rose up through the ranks in this whole thing. Because I went from junior-level SOC analyst working a 24-7 shift-type uh, job as part of a large team to... You know, within two months, I'd gotten put onto a special project. Uh, Eventually, I became a senior consultant within under a year. Um, I specialized in threat intelligence, and I I didn't even know CTI was a thing when I started. But eventually, as I got into the field, and I was like, well, you know what? Analyzing packets is great, but there's other interesting things out there, too. Um, I did have that entrepreneurial spirit, which I found benefited me greatly, because I ended up looking through all sorts of different contracts to understand how the business operated, but then I saw opportunities for growth within the, that contract review. From there, I managed to get a shot at running my first service, like a managed service. So I built that. You know, Within two years, I had taken that to, to over about a $1.2 million in like new revenue for the company, so they were super happy. Amazing. And then I ended up getting onto some government boards where they're you know, those public-private boards kind of things. So you build a profile. I kind of learned how things work nationally. I ended up getting my first shot as a director uh, running an entire cyber practice at at one of the oldest military defense contractors in the country within under four years. So I went from junior analyst to director under four years, CISO the year after that. Wow. And uh, now I, I, you know, I did my time in the defense industrial space, and that's great. I saw a really cool opportunity in online dating, and I saw an opportunity to work in Toronto. So here I am at Ruby. That's amazing. And what do you do at Ruby, just giving everybody a a sense of what that role is? So I'm the head of information security, which means um, ultimately anything security related uh, boils down to to me and my accountability. I run a fairly decent sized team, uh, fairly substantial budget as well. The the company, you know, they had a 
might have had a major event uh, last decade, and so the security culture at the organization is very, very good. Nice. I'm not sitting there having to explain why I'm asking to do certain things, but I am having to explain the ROI of why we should do it now. Uh, so that's been kind of the, the enjoyable part of the experience. Um, you know, running different teams as a senior executive when you're still relatively new in the industry. Like I'm under a decade in the industry trying to run a very diverse team that has a SOC uh, team to it. I have an application security team, I have an architecture team, I have a programs team, and we're part of a, a very, very integrated um, CI/CD pipeline. Like we do our own software development lifecycle there. So understanding secure software development when I'm coming from a pure security operations world, mm. uh, all that is to say I run all the things security, but really my job is as a head coach, as a maestro of an orchestra of high-performance specialists who are much smarter than me at what they do. You must be learning every day. Every day. Nice. Nice. Dominic, let me follow up with that and say, give me, give me a little bit about your career path. You had some really interesting moments kind of take place, some <laughs> seminal moments for you kind of moving into cyber. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm a sucker for a good origin story. I love George's origin story. But like for, for me, um, my dad was a, uh, he's retired now, but he was a high school teacher for a long time in, in, in East Vancouver. Uh, and I knew I wanted to do something with technology. But I wasn't quite sure what. So in grade 11, maybe in grade 12, I don't quite remember. But my, my dad brought home this huge stack of IT magazines. They were mainly Microsoft magazines because you know, uh, being in charge of uh, computer science there at the high school, he would get all these free magazines. And he said, there's got to be something here that interests you. And he dropped on the foot of my bed. And I was like, all right. So I just spent the next few hours going through them. And they were all like really, some of them were really tacky. Some of them were talking about, here's how to do this, you know, SQL thing here. And it was really too hands-on from a code perspective for me, and I've never really been a, a code guy, so I kept sifting through, and at one point I got frustrated, and the p pile fell over, and almost by magic, this magazine popped up, and I, was like, I, was, and I looked at it, and I said, well, what does that say? And it says, Information Security Magazine. And I was like, what in God's green earth is information security? I'd never heard the term before. So I picked it up, looked at it, read it cover to cover, and I was just blown away by it, because to me it was a mix of technology, people, uh, risk, you know, there was, you were using business lingo, business language. I thought, this is so interesting. This is what I'm going to do. And I thought, okay, well, I was already, I already decided I was going to do computer science at Simon Fraser University in, uh, out, out in uh, Vancouver. And I thought, okay, I'm going to learn about information security there. And so I went there, I did my four-year degree, and the word information security was mentioned once. And that was by me during a class when I said, no, you, uh, you skipped over the information security part of the textbook. And the professor said, oh, it's because no one really teaches that right. <laughs> so I, final, almost 20 years later, they're, they're still not really doing that in many comp sci four-year degrees, but that's a separate tirade. But so I, I decided I was going to study that on my own. Uh, I, I got my CompTIA Security Plus certification. I just absorbed and read as much as I could. Uh, I just soaked it all up. And then I thought, no, I'm going to apply for information. That's an information security job. Right? This is back before it was called cybersecurity. <laughs> cybersecurity became the sexier name. I don't think anyone really calls it information security anymore. And um, I, I just applied, applied, applied. No one's willing to give a chance on me. Held out for six, seven, eight months. My mom was constantly on my case. Oh, why don't you be a, do this, do this, do that. I was like, no, 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 this is, this is real. I can feel this is going to be something. I'm going to do this. And um, finally, one day, someone... And, uh, took a chance on me. He said, uh, I, I love the moxie. I love the, how you self-taught yourself, all this stuff. I love the energy. I'm going to pay you crap, but the job's yours. I was like, I still live at home, so great. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and that's, that, what, that sort of launched my career. Um, what, was, what was the job? It was a junior cybersecurity analyst role for a large logistics company okay. uh, out in Vancouver. Okay. At that time, it was an opportunity to move very quickly, as, as it still is in, in the industry. I ended up going, I did a spell with a consulting company, um, and I saw sort of how the sausage was made with consulting companies, and I swore off never to work for them again. Okay. And to this day, um, I have a huge disdain for, for them, and I don't think any of the big four are sponsoring this, so I'm just piss all over them. Uh, but I... Uh, Speaks for himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, and then when my, my last corporate stint brought me to the financial services industry. I worked for a large credit union. Uh, I think it was Canada's second or third largest credit union by asset size at the time. I quickly became in charge of cybersecurity, even though they were too cheap to actually give me the actual CISO title. I was pretty much the de facto CISO. And I worked under very toxic leadership 
there. Uh, the messages that I would try to convey to the board uh, were not translated. I was not allowed to talk to the board because they felt that I was being too gloom and doom, but they would paint rainbows kind of stuff, and uh, it was just very, very toxic, and it lent me being basically burned out. I became a shell of myself, uh, and my wake-up calls, my wife said, I don't even recognize you anymore. You come home, wow. you're miserable, you're jaded, you're cynical. And I, I wish I said, is there anything else? Which was obviously a very cynical <laughs> comment to say. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, it, I just took a long look at myself in the mirror, and I thought, this isn't who I want to be. And I felt like there were two, there were two versions of me. There was work me, um, who I absolutely despised, and then there was real me, who I tolerate most days. And um, you know, I, one day I just sort of, I just broke. My, I said, I, I can't do this anymore. Like it's, uh, they kept telling me how to look, how to shave. They were not fans of the, you know, I'm a bushy beard. Um, my breaking point was when I got a speaking engagement and I was representing the company and I appeared on TV as well. And they said, we don't like the language you're using. It's unbecoming of the credit union. And they said, you're not doing enough to sell the credit union services. I said, I'm talking about a hacking incident. I don't just drop in. Oh, and by the way, our TFSA account is a really good deal right now. And corp like I said, corporate broke me. And then 10 years ago, I became an entrepreneur. I fell into that, knew nothing about being an entrepreneur. I had no desire to ever be an entrepreneur. Uh, spent the past 10 years building a virtual CISO company with a, a business partner. We ended up going on divergent paths. And now I'm a solopreneur, uh, doing still CISO work for small and mid-sized organizations across the country. And doing coaching work for uh, IT leaders as well. So, What an point. incredible story. You both have pretty amazing stories. And I mean, I know you said the entrepreneurship, you know, you never had an interest in entrepreneurship, but both of your stories very much have the foundations of an entrepreneur who has to kind of see get through. I mean, you both have somebody who gave you a shot, which is very nice to see. I do have one very important question amongst all of that. Did your mom take credit for everything <laughs> that you did after? Well, all these years later, uh, when uh, you know, I... For anyone living in Vancouver, as like is in Toronto, it's it's not cheap, especially raising a family in Vancouver. And she's she always says, "Oh, I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you went into this field. I push you to do it." And I say, <laughs> "No, you didn't. <laughs> right? You didn't. So don't take credit for it. But it's a good moment. Don't cre take credit for that." <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, I mean, that's you know, both of you kind of went through a big gamut, and you've obviously hit some really interesting peaks in your career. You're kind of still moving forward, and probably still, like you said, learning a lot as you go along. Reflecting on the first job that you did, are there skills that you kind of took from that first job that are still very critical skills, or as you've kind of evolved in your career, has that has it has the skill set completely changed? Especially because we're talking, you know, a few years back without dating anybody, just what what those skills were then and now. Talk to me a little about the skills you took from your first job. Yeah, I mean. I was very technical early on, like that was everything, even though the technology is obviously very outdated <laughs> now, but it was very, very technical. I was all hands on glass and, and that type of thing. And um, But the thing that I took away from my first job was that my manager afforded me the opportunity to embed myself in the rest of the organization, right? So it allowed me to have conversations with people in marketing, communications, executives. The communication skills I learned basically by baptism by fire in terms of how to communicate to non-technical people, that became my greatest strength all these years later. And this, what I believe, is one of my calling cards when I do the work that I do is that I am able to be that conduit, that translator. And that's something that, that carries on from, from that day. I like, me. like that. How about you, George? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of tough because I, you know, I spent time in the SOC, but my job was so much more than just being a SOC analyst because, you know, I... I Every opportunity to get a different experience within the organization, I took it. So if they needed a, a technical specialist to join a sales call to be able to answer questions, happily took it. If they needed someone to come in and help on an architecture meeting, I happily took it. Mm. And even though like my knowledge of understanding like how um, networks were properly architected at the time was still like in its infancy, we'll say, um, you know, I just I needed to understand the process of how business actually does this stuff having the opportunity to understand the business of cybersecurity while actively working as an operator, I think it, it's not just one specific skill. It, it gave me a toolbox. And that toolbox helped me figure out how to get the most out of my career regardless of the phase I was at. So, I don't know, I guess adaptability would be the biggest thing. Nice. I mean, you know, and it, 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 it's not surprising to me then, both of you coming from these interesting, I wouldn't, you know, Dominic, your, yours could be called the traditional path. 
but I could call it very untraditional in terms of, first of all, you started very early and it wasn't when a lot of people were doing it. And then second of all, you've kind of had to navigate the different environments and the different places all the way to entrepreneurship. And you're both pretty big believers in what matters, what kind of skills really matter for someone entering the field. Talk to me a little bit about what you see as essential skills for individuals coming into these roles these days and right now. You know, you're, you have a military background, it'd be very easy for people to just naturally go, ah, military background to cyber, that's why it worked. And, but then you kind of explained what it took to actually do it and why someone took a chance on you. Talk to me a little bit on your end, George, about what essential skills are kind of critical for people coming into the field. So I'll tell you what the military advantage is, right? It's disciplined reliability. That's why people like ex-soldiers, is that they know they can be put through a program where there's an expected deliverable result. You put the, the goal path in front of them, you enable them on how to do it, they'll usually give it to you, right? What it took to actually kind of get stick within the process, though, is you have to be willing to uh, fail, basically. You have to be willing to fall flat on your face. And I think that's that's kind of an important thing. And, and you know, whether you're an ex-soldier, whether you used to be a teacher, whether you, uh, you know, the, the countless other fields that convert into our, our industry, really it's about kind of understanding your own strengths, understanding where your own opportunities for growth are, and then figuring out, you know, based on what your current role is in the field, if you can get that role or what your desired job is, how do I profit the most off my strengths while giving myself the opportunities to build on, we'll say, like my, I don't want to call them weaknesses, but your challenge areas, right? And if you can figure out that formula, you're going to set yourself up for a really fun, successful ride in this career. Like that. How about you, Dominic? Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about essential skills, I mean, George pretty much nailed all of them. I mean, to, to me, the, um, the additional ones, I think, are really uh, focused on the ability to just want to seek the unknown out. People who have that natural curiosity, right, are tenacious, right, have that tenacity to be given a problem, uh, like George was saying, given uh, being empowered and given the parameters and have them go figure it out. Stuff like that you can't easily teach, you know, and it's whatever you want to call it, intrinsic motivation, right, that internal fire, something that have, gives people that get up and go type, type attitude. Um, that to me is one of the core essential skills. The other one, which I'll say depending on what career path you want to go down in cybersecurity is the ability to be relatable, right? To be able to connect, to be able to, um, like I said, especially if you have aspirations of becoming a CISO, if you just want to you know, be focused on a more technical piece, um, that's fine. Not everyone likes to talk with other people. I get that. Right? I try not to talk to my mother-in-law, but I still do um, on most days. Uh, like but, that's uh, on film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, and um, the, the, but the, the ability to be a communicator on someone else's term, on, on, uh, through an uh, empathetic lens as well. So many, traditionally I say, so many security communicators, again, we fall back on the tech talk, we fall back on the acronyms. And most executives don't like to appear dumb or feel dumb in front of their tech people or their security mm. team. So what you end up having is what I've referred to as nodding syndrome. Where you know you'll, uh, I've seen it play out every pretty much so many times where you have a CISO or security director talking about, oh, here's what got blocked at the firewall, and here's all these different security technologies and IPSEC and all these different acronyms, and you see the CEO like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, that looks good, yeah, sure. That's nodding syndrome, right? So what, by, to me, essential skill, the ability to communicate, to connect, actually get that level of conversation going with an executive, so you end up talk, having a meaningful discussion around cybersecurity and not just a sort of check checkbox approach to security, which is what we've struggled with for many years. I'm so, I, I'm so interested in that, those points because I feel like they're repeated actually more and more that those communication skills, the way you talk about that stuff, the way you think about it is, it's, it is actually quite critical in these fields and it's not what people think about when they think about what's important in cybersecurity. It's not naturally what they think about. I think you know we can separate the conversation right away into two major areas, which is like what do companies and employers need to do better? And I know Dominic, on your end, you do a lot of coaching on exactly that side. But before I get there, you know, George, you're you're a you're a fan of the hot take. You're a fan of the big the big topics, you know. And so one of the ones that I've heard you say is whether you believe that someone who's coming like 18 to 20 is taking their first job 
coming right into this field and you're not sure that that's a good idea. And I have to imagine it has something to do with some of these essential skills and the kind of things we're talking about. You mind talking us through a little bit about how you think about that and why? Because I, I wouldn't, I, I know we've had that conversation. It, it's, it's a mistake to think about that from your perspective as a gatekeeping. There's like more to it. And so talk a little about how you feel about that. So I gotta tell you, first of all, I am, I'm a veteran. I'm in cyber as a CISO. I am the saltiest, oldest young man you'll ever meet. So Excellent. you need to understand that. I do. The other thing is, I just think that if people actually, and, and Jeremy, we talked about this, and you had a really good point as well, people need to have a little bit of career experience generally to understand how business works, how organizations function, how to get the most out of an organization, how to contribute the most to an organization before going into cyber. Like the pure cyber skills, whether you want to be an operator, whether you want to be an architect, whether you want to be a, a defer guy like doing forensics, uh, whatever the role is that you want to do, and even salespeople as well, actually, to speak to the non-technical side, I think if you have that experiential background of having worked in another place, you've been part of a team, you understand how team culture is, you understand what quotas are, you understand having deliverables and working through that stress and stuff, when you enter into the cyber world, which in and of itself is a massive learning challenge if you're new to it, you have the core foundational skill sets to still deliver value for an organization while you ramp up into your, we'll say, career maturity for the role you've been brought into. Whereas if you don't have that kind of previous career background and you're young and you're completely green and inexperienced, plus you're inexperienced in cyber, if you somehow get an, a job doing a junior role within a thing, you will likely be the first person that's clipped because you don't have the necessary institutional or corporate background to survive, to kind of feel out where you can still provide value even during, let's say, you know, budgetary readjustments or reorganizations. If you don't understand the game that you're playing, and in this case, we're talking about, say, the field, right? I'm an athlete, love playing sports. If I love playing football, but I have no clue what the lines on the field mean, I'm probably not going to be that good at it no matter how well I throw or run. It's the same thing applies in cyber. Right? Like I might understand code, I might understand programming, I might understand analytics or certain tool sets, but if I don't understand my employing organization, if I don't understand my clients, if I don't understand the customers, if I don't understand what the shareholders and stakeholders want, all the technical skills in the world are absolutely useless. So I think you kind of, it, when you see young folks who want to come straight out of school with no working experience in like the professional world and then try to find success in the cyber world, I'm not saying it's impossible, it's a statistical outlier because they just don't have the, the foundation to actually play the game at the right level. And, and you've kind of definitely, you know, like you've, you've mentioned getting in hot water or not. I mean, I'll, I'll leave the who criticizes or doesn't. But the idea that there's a prove it model a little bit to this for people coming into the field. You're a big believer in you need to see people prove it, which I'd have to imagine then you believe in people getting jobs to prove it. Like, yes. how, how do you see that? Like, talk, talk about that a little bit. So it depends on the types of process, right? Like if you're running a normal standard process where there isn't like a, an internship or a build-up time, you're just hiring for the role. Part of that, especially if it's a, a junior or intermediate role and you're accepting kind of quote-unquote junior-level applicants, they have to demonstrate their practical ability to deliver on the tasks or the types of tasks that you're gonna ask them to. So having some basic testing or some basic live sessions where they have to actually track a problem while being assessed by either yourself or some folks on your team, I think that's really important because it, it automatically helps build trust between the folks they're gonna work with and this new candidate who's gonna join your team. Like you, you want them to be not so much of an unknown resource when they join your team. You want your team to be hyped up and excited to work with this individual. But if they don't know what they can do or can't do, then they just become a question mark and everyone spends their whole time there wondering, should I really trust this person? Can I rely on them? Whereas if you build practical exercises and they demonstrate their skills, and then you know, let's say you have a, a team-based phase, because most people I know, they, they run the individual interviews and there's a team interview and then an exec interview. At the team-based phase, the team can actually then really throw hypotheticals at that candidate where they can start building the trust with them. Because I'm not going to lie to you, every CISO or executive does things their own way. When I'm doing evaluations, I turn to my team leads and the members of my team and I ask them, did you like this person? Should we bring them on? Even if I really like them, if my team doesn't like them, they're not getting in. I really like the nuance behind 
what it takes to trust somebody in the space and then you kind of flip it on the other side and you're going, listen, CISO is doing it all wrong generally and not thinking about it, at which point I can kind of move to you, Dominic, and go like, you're, you know, your role is dealing with a lot of coaching, but you're not coaching, like you do a lot of coaching in juniors and people coming in, but you're coaching organizations in how to do this better, right? And so talk to me a little bit about how you see that and how you do that. For sure, and I, you know, my sort of my niche with coaching is coaching uh, public sector organizations and those that struggle to get top talent. So right. they ha the, the goal there is to get the most of the talent that you have while they're there, you know, and to be part of that is being able to coach them, to nurture them, to empower them, right? To, even if they're just sort of a passing star in the night sky, you need to bottle that for as long as you can because they can't compete with private sector salary or, or what have you. And you know, um, given the example, it was a it was a, a client of mine there, a post secondary institution in the northern part of British Columbia, and I helped them build out their security team. So when I started, when the CIO brought me in, they did not have a security program. There was no dedicated security function. A bunch of people were doing it off the side of their desk. And one of the first things that we did was look at, okay, well, what can we do in terms of the first hire, our first security analyst? And, you know, posted it externally, and it was just two, 300 uh, people applied, which was sh shocking, but the majority of them didn't realize that this part of northern BC was nowhere near Vancouver. They thought they were going to Vancouver. So. <laughs> no, they're thinking northern Vancouver, yeah, not northern it's BC. A, it's yeah, a good, yeah, yeah. Like eight, sure. 10 hour drive on a good day kind of thing. Yeah. Attracting talent there, very hard. The talent pool there already very small, and it gets even smaller when you're talking about cybersecurity talent. So the obvious uh, equation there became, well, let's look internally. There was one person who was on their IT help desk team. He had been there uh, two years, had good, understood the, what the uh, organization did and had good organizational knowledge already, and he was demonstrating that he really liked cybersecurity. Right. He volunteered to, to help out um, the, the network team with security projects. So we brought him in, we interviewed him, and it was just incredible, and here we are a year later, and now we're planning for him within the year, or within within this year, to be uh, the more senior role to focus more on the strategic functions. And now, now there's another junior person they just hired about six months ago. And now he has shown a tremendous value, or tremendous interest, I should say, in the value in terms of bringing him to now sort of backfill the security uh, or the junior role. Now we're actually growing out a team internally. And I, I refer to these, both of them, as almost like franchise players. To me, it's like getting McDavid and Dreisaitl, right? They're there, you build around them, right? Yes, this is a smaller market team. Are you gonna be able to keep them around forever? I don't know, right? But if you build around them, give them the tools, the coaching, right, to get the most out of them while they're there, it's a, ver it's a very special thing. So that way, we build some sort of organizational um, knowledge there. So when they do move on, we just keep building in that, that, that farm system kind of thing, right? Build, build that pipeline because they're not going to stay forever, uh, but maybe they will. I don't know. I mean, you're setting some big, some big, uh, big expectations with Drysaddle and McDavid, <laughs> but I'll, I'll keep going. So then, I mean, in this market, and you know, you're both believers in that kind of juniors coming up, proving themselves, where they go, orgs, having to figure that out. What are the specific roles that you're seeing? that maybe are overlooked, there's a lot of roles out there. I mean, for a junior person to parse through this market and figure it out is not always easy. Where do you see the specific needs where a junior should, would be a natural fit and something that would make sense for them to kind of direct themselves to? One of the things, and just even from my observations, you know, over my 18 years or so that I've been doing this, one of the things which I really struggle with <laughs> is the lack of standardization in terms of job titles, right? You look at other job areas, right? If you say, what's an AP analyst? Everyone knows what that is in, in, within the finance function, right? If you say security analyst, security analyst at a public sector organization could be very different than a security analyst at a, pri a private sector uh, organization. I know people who are security analysts, which are basically acting as CISOs, and know security analysts at other organizations, which are, which are acting more as analysts. The lack of standardization still kills, I think, the field because there's so much confusion. Um, and again, there's, I'll say there's other Frankenstein parts to that where you still have HR functions that are, for the most part, in control of these job descriptions. So you have these job descriptions being created by non-security people, and that ends up just being, what I refer to, just sort of like a Google um, a collation there of all these different job descriptions from all over the place, and they don't make sense, right? 
So to me, if we're going in order here, I like to see the industry move in terms of we need to start standardizing. This is what a security analyst means. This is what maybe a senior analyst means. This is what an architect means. I think among professionals like George and others in the field, we know what it means. We need HR functions to start <laughs> coming on board and standardizing this right across the board, private and public. Um, so that, that to me, I would say, I, that would be the, my, my priority. So your, your statement to any junior who's going, okay, where should I focus is, trust me, none of this means anything yeah. anyways, <laughs> just start looking? Well, is that, is well, that? The, the thing, I, for, for me, the, and it's, it's not like a, a hang on, I'm very curious to hear what Jordan has to say, but uh, uh, the, to me, the job title, um, again, depending on where you want to go, could mean something. So as an example, uh, there's a good friend of mine who I've, I've coached for, for years. He's now looking at taking on sort of an internal security lead approach just so he can go back out into the field because he hasn't had the, uh, a CISO role. He wants to have that CISO role, but now he's positioned himself so he can at least get the CISO title even though they're not, he's not functionally acting as a CISO because he's not an officer of the organization, but that title will allow him to, to, to get there. Why? Well, because you, again, I'm going to say point, point fingers back to HR. Right? Again, I don't want to necessarily make HR people feel bad, but um, that's, I think, a, a lot of stuff is being held up at the, at the HR level. Yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, Don brings up a really good point about the lack of standardization. He is correct. Like, even within the CISO role itself, mm -hmm. like, there's Tactical CISOs, which are really just team lead analysts, yeah. right, and completely underfunded and, and non-enabled teams. You have your, um, you know, you could say your your uh, strategic CISO, which is actually like a more of a middle manager, mm -hmm. still usually reporting up to a couple layers to the top. And then you have your, your proper executive CISO, who's a, a C-suite, who's fully empowered as a C-suite and has board level responsibilities. So depending on the class of organization you're trying to work at, the size of the team, size of the budget, so many different factors, who you are and what your job is. Like if I was a, a tactical level CISO, I'm a team lead, but I'm still effectively an analyst. Mm -hmm. So you're still, you're processing alerts. You're still filing reports. You're doing the thing. You're just an analyst with a fancy title and a lot more pressure. Whereas if you're a C-suite, like if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky in my day job, I get to hop in on an investigation. Most of the time though, I'm dealing in business. This was not perhaps the skill set that I was educated for, but this is the nature of the role. Mm -hmm. It's all the same title, right? So I think what's smart, and depends on what you want to do when you're trying to get into the field, I will always say if you have intents to be a CISO someday or you want to be that kind of executive in security, I personally, and a lot of folks that I know, that I, that I respect, I like people that have operator backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Find yourself a SecOps job, a security operations role. And you know what, even, even forensics investigators, fine, but that's still a little bit more senior. You, you could even do some, some application security type stuff, which is great, that's a technical role. We are living in the era of applications, so it's totally valid. But at the end of the day, if I'm seeing someone as a CISO, or I'm looking at them, or I'm looking at a statement they made or something they put out, and within their background, there's no time spent working in a SOC, they're either just a pure business person or a pure GRC person. Respect to our GRC friends. We all need compliance. They just don't have the same weight of professional respect in my eyes. So if you really want to be in this game and you want to have the gravitas that comes with it and you want to have that lived experience to lead your teams and talk to your boards and be that hero, quote unquote, there's no heroes in security, you should spend some time as an analyst. You need to know and this is just a basic, like my kind of philosophy on leadership, and it comes back from my time in the Canadian Armed Forces, you need to be able to do the job of people two ranks under you and two ranks above you. So how can I give orders to an operations team or some kind of team if I have no lived experience understanding what I'm asking them to do or the challenges they face? So I really like that you just painted a picture of, you know, to be CISO, here's a really good opportunity in SecOps, right, where you can kind of move forward and move. Analyst is a great place to start as you're kind of moving in. What's the skill, if you're, if you're hiring a junior analyst in a market filled with people wanting to get into the field, yes, let's, let's assume they have a couple of years of professional experience somewhere so we don't get into that kind of territory. Um, what's the specific skill that you're looking for? You go, you go in an interview, what separates out people right off the bat? What matters to you? Persistence. 
persistence. So if you're an analyst, right, you're gonna, I, I, I call it like the 90-10 the cycle, right? And people have all sorts of different uh, nomenclatures for it, but 90% of your job is honest to God boring as hell. You're dealing through alerts, a lot of false positives, reconfigs, dealing with clients, clients annoying, that's okay. Deal with your supervisor, supervisor annoying, that's okay. But then that real incident happens, right? And let's say it's tough. Let's say you, you can't find the immediate answer. Pressure's coming from all over you. Board wants to know what's going on. CEO wants to know what's going on. Client wants to know what's going on. It feels like the entire world is crashing. You have to be the calmest, most persistent person in the room to solve that problem because you're the one that's actually enabled to do so. If I see someone that, you know, they're persistent, that means they're probably, they have some degree of mental resilience. They have a tenacity to them. They're curious. They're go-getters. These are the types of people that, you know, if you don't have that persistence, that's an intangible. You can't really teach that. So if you have someone that has that, I can teach you cyber. I can teach you ops. Every shop kind of does things differently anyway. But you can't teach someone that just has that dog in them. Are you, are you evaluating that through a test in an interview? Or are you evaluating that through looking at what else they've done like that in their life where they've had persistence? Like, how are you approaching yeah, that like, in an interview? First of all, there are, there are tests and things that you can put into an interview process where you're seeing, like, how would they respond? It's really um, trying to determine what their decision-making process is. So you can go through the typical interview question of like, in your career, can you provide an example where you have blah, blah, blah? Or you pose them a written challenge. You're just like, hey, here's the scenario. How would you deal with this? You really want to determine what their decision-making process and logic is so that you can kind of figure out, okay, given this scenario, I kind of know how this person will react. This is the person I want on the team. Love that. How about you, Dominic? Uh, coachability. Uh, and an offshoot of that would be humility, right? So, again, especially someone in, in starting out in their career, you want them to be coachable, right? You don't want them to be uh, someone who just thinks that they know it all and they're hotshot. Uh, to me, when I think of security people I've come across over my career, like we need to see fewer and fewer people with hero syndrome. There's a lot of people who just sort of do it alone and Right, they don't communicate to anyone else. Right? We need teams. We need high-performing teams, right? uh, uh, highly efficient teams, teams, to George's point, that can stay calm during the crisis. Right? You're not going to get that if you're not grounded in coachability and humility. Right? So, and that, to me, is the type of stuff that can, is very apparent in the first few minutes of a conversation, you know, uh, especially in an interview session. You're able to tell if someone's humble or not. You know? And um, so that, to me, is what I certainly look for when like, I, I'm... I'm a solopreneur, I'm not hiring people, but as I'm guiding my clients through their hiring process, especially those that are trying to either start or grow their security team, that's one of the things that I'm looking for. Right? And you know, uh, George mentioned er earlier, I think from a cultural perspective, um, I know people will use the term cultural fit. I look for someone who is, is, is this someone gonna be a cultural enhancer? Are they gonna make the culture even stronger as a result of their presence here? Uh, I mean, there's a fine line between the humility and the confidence, mm -hmm. right? That balance of for what sure. you need when you say you're looking for it right yeah. off the bat. I imagine you need some confidence as a junior level person coming in to go, I can figure this out, yep. but the humility to go, I'm not above not knowing how to figure it out yet, yep. right? And that. And, and I'll give a, uh, an example of a, um, a friend of mine. He's a very high up in the, uh, in the security function at a health authority. Um, and, you know, like many public sector organizations, especially with the security team, I, it's very transient. They have people that just stay for a short time and then move on. So he's constantly you know, hiring, and he's looked for at non-traditional areas where he's brought people in. And um, he has someone who's uh, part of his uh, cryptography team who um, knew nothing about security. And in fact, his major was, I, don't remember, I might be butchering it here, but he basically majored in playing the oboe. Uh, but with musicians, they know numbers. It's amazing. Right? And so when the guy interviewed, um, he was very humble. He said, hey, you know what, I, I know tech, like I'm a techie, I like playing around with this type of stuff, but this is what I don't know. But I'm willing to learn if you're able to, to coach me and you know, bring me up to speed. Like, he has a fairly large team and you know, he's a big believer in knowledge transfer, that type of stuff. And the like guy said, I know numbers, and that's why I think I can do really well in cryptography. It's, it's so funny, uh, you know, it's a, side, it's a little bit of a sidetrack, but at Lighthouse Labs, we've seen 
so many musicians come through our programs and be successful in software, in data, and cyber. And it actually goes back a little bit also to the point that George made around this idea of dedication, reliability, and persistence. Because in music, the idea that you are, like, the feedback of you being good or bad yeah. is literally sounding out of the instrument yeah. and your willingness to kind of learn it and practice yeah. and go through it. I mean, it's a very humbling thing to yeah. start, right? Like, you have to be able to go through that yeah. downtime before you get to good. And every time you get good, there's a new level of, yeah. oh, this is what I'm actually not good at anymore. So it is, it is really interesting. We've, we've seen that quite a lot. Uh, I'll, I'll save you from saying that Lighthouse Labs is the best program to get into this field. Um, obviously, we know that to be true. But beyond that, I guess, what are you seeing in education opportunities? What do you like that you're seeing in the field that is helping people actually prepare for coming into this space? You kind of took a dig before where you said, you know, information security still maybe not taught uh, in schools the way it should be. But where are you seeing the good education come from, whether it's on the job or before the job? Um, for me, like I'm seeing a lot of these like easily available like um, hack the box type mm. platforms that are accessible to everyone, where you don't even have to be employed in the field to be able to learn the exercises to get practical uh, experience actually doing the thing. Um, you know, like there are a lot of people sometimes they want to get in the field, but it's like cool. Well, do you, do you want to set up a virtual environment? And they have no clue what to do. Mm. And you're like, okay, so how are you going to test anything? So how are we going to employ you? Like it's, you have to make, you have to go from the world of theory, which is a lot of what the post-secondary programs love doing, mm -hmm. and, and get more into the practical of like, all right, you're day one on the job. Here are some of the tasks you're going to have to encounter. And I think if you can look for educational experiences or OJTs, like on-the-job training opportunities, I, I really hate unpaid internships. I don't agree with them. But... Even if it comes down, if you have enough savings to go through an unpaid internship, if that's your only shot, at least it gets you real working experience. Do you value that? Like, do you, so you see someone go through it, are you twice as inclined to hire them coming out of something like that? Yeah, I, if, someone, if someone tells me that, hey, I have these uh, use cases and these practical exercises that I've completed and I can show you like the receipts of everything versus like, I have these certs, respect to our friends at SANS, I could care less about the certs. I want the guy that's done the exercises. Mm. The, pr the real practical experience. That's it, yeah. How about you, Dominic? I, I'll, I'll do both sides. So I completely agree with what George said there. To me, the, the best of the best is the, the, the hands-on stuff, like that, the practical stuff, the stuff that you're actually doing, and, and it's, it's come a long way. You know, it's like, it's mm. incredible, that stuff. But to me, where I think there's still a lot of failing, I see a lot of people still going towards it is that traditional post-secondary um, route there where uh, even like again, comp side degrees to me in, in Canada, I'm not aware of any that bake in cybersecurity, right? There's sort of electives or you can do it as a thing. To me, that should be baked right into the curriculum, right? And this is all these years later, not enough change has happened there. And another thing which infuriates me, and I know this happens in Vancouver, I imagine it happens uh, out here in Toronto as well, there are several institutions that I will not name. Basically, they tout the masters of cybersecurity. And like, oh, this, this, we guarantee you this is going to fast track you. You're going to get success and all that stuff. And they generally cater to international students. So the international students pay a ton, a ton of money to these institutions. And I can't tell you how many times I feel calls from people who say, I paid all this money to go to this institution. I have my masters of cybersecurity. Uh, but unless I get a job in six months, I have to leave the country. And they struggle to get basic security rules. And basically these institutions hang them out to dry because they already got their tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars from these students. And you don't need a master's of cybersecurity. If you want to do that, that's fine. There's certain fields where if you, need to, if you want to fast track your success, you need uh, a master's, like an MBA. Someone with a business degree, if they want to become like a CFO or something, you need an MBA, right? A, a business degree is not going to get you there. In cybersecurity, you don't need a master's to get up to the CISO role. You don't, right? Uh, it's just the, the way it is right now, and I'm not trying to uh, downplay a master's, but a lot of these institutions are taking advantage of, I'll say, the hotness of the industry and basically doing bait and switches with people. So there's a lot of negative forces, I'll, I'll still say, that are, are holding the field back. Can I, can I build on that? Yeah, thing? absolutely. Go ahead. So you brought up a really good point about the post-secondaries, and I have a major beef with them. Like I, I just recently put a post about this that 
the comp site program should have mandatory yes. information security yeah, components yeah. to them. And the fact that they don't in an era where like ransomware is king and we're trying to teach people about secure DevOps, it blows my mind. If you want to talk about like when I'm doing a, a resume review, if someone's at an economic program and you know, we all know the colleges and universities do it. If their program has a phase in it where they're actually embedded with an employer, Right, where there's an actual like on the job training component that they get credit for, I will immediately respect that program infinitely more than all these other folks that are just selling tuition for a piece of paper. Like, and look at this, man. Like, we were talking just now, you're talking about your background, your history. It's super cool. You're an operator, right? You saying that to me automatically gives me, or it, it makes me give you an additional layer of respect because you, you've done it, man. You've done sticks in the weeds, you've gotten your hands dirty. Everything you say going forward, I now can consider a little bit more valid as a result of that. It's the same thing. You might have a massive academic background, even a PhD in it, but if there's no point in that time where you actually did the thing, protecting a real environment, I can't employ you. Yeah. What I really, what I really do like, uh, you know, when you bring this kind of stuff up, and obviously I have a vested interest in the education space, uh, but you bring up something that's really in the news quite a bit, the new Canadian side, people coming, the visas being handed out, all that. There's a lot of stuff that with, within our governing policy that kind of affects the cybersecurity world. Talk to me a little bit about, do you believe stuff like recessions, layoffs, Different stuff like that are having an impact in the cybersecurity world. Do you see any impact on, uh, you know, I mean, we can get into AI if you want, but what, what are you seeing out there? Well, first of all, um, this, this has already been a success. My whole goal is to get George to like and respect me, so I'm, that was, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> Shut the cameras. <laughs> We're done. We're done. Make sure the conflict. I hope he invites you onto his podcast. Drop the batter, yeah. The, uh, um, but... Uh, from my perspective, you know, where I've seen, um, I'll say, pinches of the recession, it's more so um, with smaller organizations. So for me, I do a lot of virtual or fractional work with organizations that don't have an internal cybersecurity team. With organizations that do have internal cybersecurity teams, I haven't seen necessarily them laying people off from the security team. I've seen maybe hiring freezes. Maybe they haven't sort of expanded the team or plans to expand the team of slowed, but where I've seen the greatest pinch is with organizations that are small enough that they're either about to grow their team or start a team or have stopped engaging um, cybersecurity, again, consultants, fractional leaders like myself, because they didn't have the money. And in 2023, I can't tell you how many calls I fielded from people, uh, executives, business owners who said, yeah, we know cybersecurity is important. I see ransomware all the time on the news. Our competitors just got hit by ransomware. But we're scared with whether or not we're going to have cash six months from now, so we're not spending on this. And it was, as an entrepreneur, I, was like, I said, as a secure professional, I think you're an idiot. But as a business owner, I get where you're coming from, right? And that, being an entrepreneur, allowed me to get, get that sort of perspective. But, um, and that's very much what I saw through all of 2023. The, I, so far, uh, you know, with each passing time when the, the rates don't go up, it's fine. I, so, uh, every time the Bank of Canada says, oh, rates are, rates are good, I usually have a great few days in terms of <laughs> close, closing business. But um, that, to me, is where I, say, I saw the greatest pinch last year was, again, with those small organizations that they're getting slammed, but they don't have internal cybersecurity cyber teams. Fair. And I, I know we're going to be a little tight for time. And so, George, I actually want to move on. I'm just going to ask you a separate question here, um, which is that, you know, you, you have a very, you, you kind of mentioned a system within your company of how people are raised and developed and how you think about, you know, yourself as a performance coach. Um, as companies and programs, like what I, what I really respect is companies that are thinking proactively about how people are growing in their company, whether that's cutthroat, whether it's like training and development dollars, like whatever it is, but they're really considering how someone comes in and what they need to do. You mentioned kind of your first, what people are doing in their first two years and coming to your company and how you view that. Can you talk a little about that? Just, I, would, I really want people who are employers or companies thinking about how they're bringing in different talent and securing their companies more. How they do have to consider what it is to bring talent in and what it is to evaluate on the job. You mind talking about that a little bit? The way that I kind of look at things, and then thankfully the company's bought into my vision of doing this, you have to ultimately... Um, you, you attain retention by providing succession planning from day one. 
So when you hire someone new and they're part of your team, my philosophy is I'm not going to get the most out of you while I'm working with you or whatever. It's not a resource extraction mentality. It's, hey, we're working together. I know we're probably not going to work together forever, but I want you to be as successful as you can be in your career. Like, like my job as a leader is to see them be as successful as possible. If you go into it with that mindset, then it's like, okay, cool. What are you good at doing? What do you like doing? Then you build a kind of uh, a performance plan around enabling that. And then you give them tangible goals where it's like, hey, if you've shown competence in A, B, and C, I will give you this opportunity where it's like, you really want this cert? Cool. Earn the cert. You want this promotion? Cool. Show me that you can do this, this, and this, and you'll have this promotion by you know, roughly this time. I like giving it a deadline so it's real. Mm-hmm. Obviously, business conditions can change and people can understand that. You have to be transparent in your communication. But if they know, like by the carrot and stick mentality, if I work hard and I achieve the performance I need to, I will get this carrot, people will immediately begin to work harder. They'll be more committed. They'll be bought into the thing. They'll stay with you. If people reach a point where either one, they just don't have the performance to meet the goals that you set for them in year one, year two, and especially if they're early in their career, I'm sorry to say this, this probably isn't your jam. Or this isn't the right organization at this point in your life. I think any junior analyst should be able to try for a senior analyst job within two years. It is not a place where you're supposed to linger and stay in the industry. As you continue kind of the succession planning approach from a management perspective, I tell my people, like, there are a couple of my team leads. I look at them. I'm like, I'm training you to be able to replace me tomorrow because I don't want this job forever. I want to do different things with my life. I am trying to build people who can step into my role, whether I get sick, whether I die, heaven forbid, or if I just want to move on and do something different, they can step in and maintain the legacy of what we've all built together as a team. So knowing that there's the potential for them to attain that you know, D-suite, C-suite kind of executive role from where they started based on the work plan that we've put together for them, they're bought in, they're giving maximum performance every day, you're getting maximum output from them, you're showing return on investment for the hire, and your, your team is cohesively staying together because they're, they're invested in seeing each other succeed. This is the difference of a culture of growth versus a, you know, a cutthroat cutting culture where we're going to cut 10% of all the poor performers, poor performers across the company every year. I think that's how you approach things and how you look at your people as growth resources, as, as, as folks who, even when you don't work together anymore, the majority of people I've worked with in my past career, I wish them nothing but the best success, even if they surpass me. It just means I did my job when we were working together. Growth, the growth versus the cutthroat in a policy that allows you to kind of let people go after a couple of years if they're not reaching that potential is a really interesting nuanced piece that I'm sure like you've had to explain a couple times as you kind of go through it but it makes a lot of sense and I think starting with the first principle of growth as opposed to let's just you know cut low performers is a is a very major difference to me so I I love that Um, knowing we're kind of getting close here uh, let me ask you a couple rapid fire I know you guys are verbose so let's go, let's go single words, okay, or, or, or as close as you can. Um, advice to a job seeker who is trying to get through this market with a lot of different people, a lot of different certifications. If they were doing one thing, if you were recommending one thing they do while trying to get this job, it's what? Network. Build friends. Yeah. Not just network. Like, n- learn how to network. There's a difference between like, I'm going to go introduce myself or just add everyone on LinkedIn versus like, I'm going to create a substantive relationship with you as someone who I potentially want to work with. And if it works out, it works out. I'm giving Dominic the point for one word, Uh, but Uh, that's a good answer. (laughs) Um, If you're talking to employers who are struggling to find talent and ignoring on the junior side of things, what's one thing they can do better to improve that ability to bring in a junior level person? Invest. Invest? Yep. Nice. Kept it to one. I want to know why. I want to know invest in what, but I won't ask. <laughs> Go ahead. It's two words. Think differently. Think or differently. Or hire differently. Okay. I like that. And do both of you believe that Canada in the next three, four years, do you see any world where Canada is going to need less cyber talent than it does now? Is this a career that has a, is there, is there a cap coming? at any point on all these roles and jobs? No. 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 Okay. 
I think I think that's an important point for people just listening and watching and because I do think that the market is a very difficult one to penetrate and get into and sometimes it's not a linear you know we see it all the time at Lighthouse it's not linear you apply for 20 jobs you get zero answers you apply for 30 you get one you apply for the next 10 you get five but it's kind of like this but the key is is that long-term goal back to goals right this feels like a field that what you might take some time getting into once you get into though there's a lot of room to grow and a lot of room to do here I'm gonna thank you both so much for everything you just contributed here. I know everybody listening and watching, uh, guaranteed they took some immense things away. If anything, uh, for sure that Dominic loves his mother-in-law. <laughs> and uh, no, I really, I really appreciate you sharing all your time and thoughts with us. This was fantastic. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.